हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर एम एन गुप्ता एमेरिटस प्रोफेसर फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोकेमिकल इंजीनियरिंग एंड बायोटेक्नोलॉजी एट इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी दिल्ली टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक ऑन पम्प्स एंड ए टी पी एज फ्रॉम पेपर structure and function of biomolecules too so we now come to the function of membranes which was historically the first one to be recognized how do biomembranes allow transport of the molecules in a regulated fashion so we look at the transport processes and in the membranes which are involved in this function in the next module we look at the membrane channels so the objective of this module are to learn how early studies on sodium and potassium pump contributed to our understanding of pumps or transporters to learn the differences between uniporters symporters and antiporters which are basically subclasses three subclasses of transporters we'll also learn about another interesting class of transporter which is called multi drug transporter and we will also learn about the important role which is there which is played in this process by class of compounds which are known as cardiac glycosides so the concept maps is that this module is all about pumps or transporters we'll first talk about atpases and we'll talk about atpases which act as a pumps and we'll see that the atpases have three classes p type v type and f type and then we will talk about the transporters and there also we'll see that they have three classes called uniports symports and antiports so a well known example of a pump is the sodium ion potassium ion pump eukaryotic cells maintain a sodium potassium ion gradient across its plasma membrane this also ensures a membrane electrical potential operation of sodium ion potassium ion pump is one kind of atpa dependent transporter of molecules the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator is the second type of transporter which requires energy from atp hydrolysis ion channels open up and allow ions to pass through when a specific ligand binds the ion link channel receptors a well known example of such a specific ligand is acetylcholine of the nerve muscle uh, junction majority of animal cells have a high sodium ion potassium ion concentrations inside the cell this is maintained by the sodium ion potassium ion the movement of these ions require energy in the form of atp the enormity of the importance of the sodium potassium pump can be judged by the fact that about 33% of atp hydrolyzed by a resting animal happens for operating this pump the sodium potassium gradient is responsible for many phenomena it ensures that cell volume remains within a narrow range at all times it is also responsible for nerve cells and 
muscle cells being responsive to the electrical stimuli. Sodium potassium pump is also responsible for ensuring the transport of sugars and amino acids. It is due to this that the term pump is increasingly replaced by transporter in the recent literature. Jens Scon, way back in 1957, found that an enzyme, an ATPase, which functions only if sodium ion, potassium ion, and magnesium ions were present. The requirement of mag magnesium ions was not a surprise, as all ATPases are known to require magnesium ions. The requirement of sodium and potassium ions, however, was an unusual feature, so the enzyme came to be known as sodium potassium ATPase. Hence, the pump is nothing but an enzyme. The other term transporter also should not cause confusion. What we have is an enzyme which is a hydrolase. It turns out that all transport proteins or transporters are asymmetric integral membrane proteins. These are capable of existing in two conformers which can interconvert. The transition between two conformational states of the transporter is analogous to the interconversion of soluble allosteric proteins as per the two step model. In fact, many of the features of those allosteric proteins are common to transporters. Such transporters include some which are involved in transport of more than one species. Hence, the transporters are classified into unipoles, sympoles, and antipoles. This classification is based upon the feature of their being involved in transport of a single or more than one species at the same time and whether the movement is in the same or a different direction. Uniport catalyzes the transport of only one species at any time. A well-known example of this is glucose transporter in red blood cells. Simple transports two species at the same time. Even the direction of the transport is same for both species. Some authors prefer a general term for term of co-transport systems to include both sympoles and antipodes. Antipodes are transporters that involve simultaneous movement of two different species but in opposite directions. For this, a well-known example is available in the form of chloride bicarbonate exchanger. It may be added that this classification does not worry about whether the transport is active or passive. Only active transport which involves ATP hydrolysis can be viewed as an enzymatic process. It may be useful at this stage to introduce another classification from the perspective of ATP hydrolysis. Evolution has resulted in design of various kinds of ATPases which differ in structure, mechanistic details, and localization within the cells. The first category is that of P-type ATPases. The key feature of these is reversible phosphorylation of an aspartate residue and inhibition by a phosphate analog vanadate. The structural similarity between the two ions makes the vanadate inhibition understandable. P-type ATPases have wide distribution. All animal tissues have sodium potassium ATPase and antipota and calcium ion ATPase which is a uniporter for calcium. These help to maintain ionic gradients 
between cytosol and the extracellular milieu. As an example of their physiological significance, it is a P type ATPase in cell lining in cells which line the stomach, which ensures acidity in the stomach. In higher plants, an ATPase creates a difference of 2 pH units across the plasma membrane that creates the electrochemical gradient. Bacteria also operate a P type ATPase pump to get rid of the metal ions such as calcium ion, mercuric ion from their cells. The uptake of substances and ionic species by Neurospora also is carried out by a pump which drives out protons. P type ATPases are characterized by generally having two types of subunit structures. It is the alpha unit which has the critical aspartate which is involved in photophosphorylation. Not only aspartate but sequence around this critical residue is also highly conserved among P type ATPases. For example, sheep kidney sodium potassium ATPase, rabbit cardiac calcium ATPase, red gastric potassium hydrogen proton potassium ion ATPase and E. coli potassium ion ATPase which are all P type ATPases have considerable homology in the sequence around the aspartic residue. The P type pumps or transporters are sometimes called P type ion motive ATPases have a mass of about 100 kilo Dalton and are reversibly interconverted between phosphorylated and dephosphorylated forms. Their existence is very old as shown by the example of E. coli potassium ion ATPase. The similarity of sequence around the aspartate in both bacterial and animal pumps shows that evolution did not tinker much with the design of the p-type ATPases. While P-type ATPases are more versatile as they transport variety of species, V-type transporters transports only protons. They are called V-type as these occur in membranes of vacuoles in yeast and fungi and in plants. V-type ATPases are bigger in size, more than 400 kilo Dalton. Here, the different subunits are involved in steps like ATP hydrolysis and proton movement. Understandably, these processes are coupled conformationally. This implies that these conformational transitions of the molecule cannot be analyzed by a simple two-step model. While these were named V-type after vacuoles, these are not restricted to just yeast, fungi and plants. In animal V-type ATPases are part of the membranes of lysosomes, endosomes and secretory vesicles. V-type ATPases also play an important role in clethrin coated vesicles and Golgi apparatus. Thus the proton movement is coupled into protein targeting. In fact, acidifying intracellular compartments is their general role. The vacuoles of fungi and plants are able to maintain pH in the range of 3 to 6, which is lower than the cytosolic pH, due to the action of V type ATPases. V type ATPases do not undergo reversible phosphorylation cycles. Thus, absence of inhibition by vanadate ion is a good way to distinguish between P type and V type transporters. The low pH in some of these compartments activates proteases and other hydrolytic enzymes. Then transmembrane domain V0 is a proton channel. The peripheral domain V1 has ATPase activity. The V-type ATPases are closer to F-type ATPases. The oxidative phosphorylation by mitochondria coupled to the respiratory chain is the well-known example of F-type ATPase. F-type ATPases of course involves proton gradient as we know. 
However, their physiological function is to form ATP rather than hydrolyzing it. While F-type ATPases occur in inner mitochondrial membrane eukaryotes, higher plants have these in thylakoid membranes. In prokaryotes, these ATP synthesizing enzymes are part of the plasma membranes. Structurally, they have FC domain which spans membranes and F1 catalytic unit. Sometimes F-type ATPases are called ATP synthases. The letter F refers to factors in early days of work on oxidative phosphorylation, many new proteins which were discovered were simply called factors. Many eukaryotic cells contain transports of all the above three types. Prokaryotes don't have E-type ATPases. Eukaryotes carry out exocytosis and endocytosis. Hence, from evolutionary point of view, V-type ATPases are more recent. The F unit, when isolated as a soluble factor, acts as an ATPase rather than ATP synthase. So, it is the proton gradient as a result of redox activity of respiratory chain, which drives ATPase towards synthesis function. In mid-1980s, it was found that many tumors were found to be resistant to anti-tumor compounds. This led to the discovery of fourth type of ATPases, which are called multi-drug transporters. It was found that these transporters present in the plasma membrane of these tumor cells could expel many diverse drugs, so the concentration of the anti-tumor drugs never reached an effective concentration. The multi-drug transporter is a 170 kilo Dalton integral protein having 12 transmembrane segments and two ATP binding sites. The transporter also functions like an ion channel. That function, of course, is ATP independent. The multi-drug transporter is effective in removing both natural and synthetic drugs from the cytosol. The list includes venoblastine, doxorubicin, actinomycin, mitomycin, taxol, colchicine, and paromycin. The common feature is the hydrophobicity of the drugs. Sodium potassium pump is among the most extensively studied active transport system as far as eukaryotic plasma membranes are concerned. As we mentioned earlier, Jens Scon was the person who initiated work on this pump. It's a transmembrane protein with two types of subunits. The alpha, two alpha subunits are non-glycosylated and are of 110 kilodalton each and are the sites of binding of ions and catalysis. The 55 kilodalton beta subunits, again two in number, do not appear to have any known function except perhaps aid in formation of alpha 2 beta 2 hydro tetramer. The hydrolysis of one ATP molecule is accompanied by phosphorylation of the aspartate residue in the protein. The resulting conformational change leads to three sodium ions pumped out and two potassium ions pumped in across the plasma membrane. Both ions move against the concentration gradient, so it is active transport and requires the energy in the form of ATP hydrolysis. The ATP hydrolysis and the pumping of ions in opposite directions is coupled system. Either phenomenon cannot occur in isolation. The ATPs clearly is an antiport and generates a charge separation across the membrane. Expulsion of three sodium ions is necessary for animal cells to control the osmotic pressure of the cytoplasm. Animal cells do not have supporting cell wall. In the absence of the pump, water would come in, swell the cell and would lead to its bursting. The phosphorylation of the aspartate residue requires the presence of sodium ion. Similarly, its dephosphorylation cannot take place in the absence of potassium ion. The alpha subunit has eight transmembrane helices with two cytoplasmic domains. It is the cytoplasmic domain at which ATP binds. Beta subunit has only one alpha helical transmembrane segment. 
but bigger extracellular domain. It is there that the beta subunit is glycosylated. The pump is present in all cells wherein active transport of sodium and potassium takes place. Some cells which require this transport more have higher activity. When Scon observed the transport and the ATP is activity, it took some brilliant work to establish that the pump and the ATP is activities are due to the same structure. For example, it was also found that the sodium ion potassium ion concentration gradients affect the pumping action and ATP is activity same way. They are two cardiac or cardiotonic steroids which inhibit both pumping action and ATP is activity. The KI of inhibition for both activities by either of the steroid derivatives is identical. The action of these cardiac glycosides helped in gaining insight into sodium ion potassium ion pump. The first one is from Digitalis. Digitalis is an extract of purple foxglove leaves and is also a mixture of several glycosides. The prominent among these is digitoxin. Digitalis has been around for centuries as a natural product which was used to treat congestive heart failure. In fact, it has been shown in the steroid part in this that this compound called digitoxygenin unsaturated lectone ring at C17 is necessary for the physiological effect. Not only that OH group at the C14 and a cis fusion of C and D rings are also necessary. Thus the carbohydrate component in digitoxin is not required. Only steroid digitoxygenin has the physiological function. Another cardiac glycoside ubane is derived from lost African ubayo tree also works similarly. While digitalis has been around as a drug, ubane also has been known for a long time as arrow tips were coated with ubane by tribals. Even in ubane, the carbohydrate part is not necessary to inhibit the pump. Both cardiac steroids bind to the extracellular part, the alpha subunits. Ubane, it so turns out, is just not a natural product from exotic tree. It is actually an animal hormone which regulates the cellular sodium ion concentration and water balances. It has been hence again also mentioned when we discuss steroid hormones. In order to further understand the action of cardiac glycosides, we should first discuss what we know about the various steps in the way the sodium potassium pump operates. We have already mentioned that the enzyme occurs in two conformational states. The enzyme in the even state binds intracellular sodium ion followed by ATP binding. So the complex even ATP and 3 sodium ion is formed. ATP phosphorylates the key aspartate residue and the ADP leaves. So now the complex is even phosphate and 3 sodium ions. The high energy bond in aspartyl phosphate drives the conformational change in the enzyme and the resulting complex now is E2 phosphate and 3 sodium ions. It now releases 3 sodium ions which move outside the cell. Two potassium ions enter and the complex E2 phosphate, two potassium ions is formed. The aspartyl phosphate in the E2P part is hydrolyzed and gives E2 and two potassium ion complex. 
the E2 conformation reverting to E1 releases two potassium ions inside the cell. E1 is ready for another transporter cycle. Both ATP hydrolysis and ion transport are vectorial processes, so the cycle is unidirectional. Cardiac glycosides stop the hydrolysis of phosphate in the E2 phosphate 2 potassium ions complex. The result is increased sodium ion concentration inside the cell. This in itself does not explain the action of digitoxin. For understanding that, we also will have to learn about the sodium ion calcium ion antipode system. However, before we discuss the transporter, let us look at the sodium ion potassium ion pump in a little more detail. The orientation of the ATPase was learned from studies using model system of erythrocyte ghost cells. Erythrocytes placed in a hypotonic solution swell and develop holes in the membranes. Hemoglobin goes out leaving the pale ghost cells. Such erythrocytes ghost cells, when placed in an isotonic solution, restores the membranes. This allows control on a species which can be resealed inside. Such systems reveal interesting behavior of the pump. ATPase functions if sodium ion is inside and potassium ion is outside. ATP has to be available inside the ghost for the pump to function. Cardiac steroids inhibit the pump but only when present outside the cells. On the other hand, venidate, a phosphate analog, inhibits the pump but only when present on the inside. These results form the basis for the mechanistic picture, the vectorial nature, which is mentioned earlier. In the, in the entire one cycle of operation, four forms of the enzyme can be identical E1, E1P, E2P, and E2. The four forms of the enzymes can be identified the E1, E1P, E2P, and E2. The turnover number of ATPase is about 100, second in, 100 per second. Venidate inhibits at nanomolar concentrations as it is able to replace PI in the two forms of the enzymes. In fact, venidate by being able to also form pentacovalent bipyramidal transition state, just like inorganic phosphate species. It acts as the inhibitor in most of the phosphoryl transfer reactions. The pump is said to be electrogenic as it generates the electrical current across the membrane. ATP hydrolysis and the electron or the ion movement are coupled. This is in line with the two familiar phenomena. In oxidative phosphorylation, blocking ATP formation can stop flow of the electrons across the respiratory chain. In muscle contraction also, the similar coupling is witnessed. If red cells are incubated in higher concentrations of sodium ion and lower potassium ion concentrations, the steep ionic gradient reverses the pump activity and ATP is synthesized. The credit for explaining how ATP is phosphorylation and dephosphorylation causes ions to move belongs to Oleg Zardetsky in 1966. According to him, the binding sites in E1 and E2 face in different directions. E1 and E2 have high affinity for sodium ion and potassium ion respectively. E2 is stable in phosphorylated form, whereas E1 is stable in the dephosphorylated form. In the beginning of the cycle, binding of sodium ion is followed by its phosphorylation. Stability considerations causes E1P to the E2P transition and now the ion binding site faces outside. 
potassium ion binding follows dephosphorylation another aversion and release of potassium ion inside sodium ion and potassium ion do not have drastic differences in their ionic radii and hence phosphorylation and dephosphorylation can easily cause changes in the cavity by few angstrom to cause change in the affinity of the cavity for the sodium ion or potassium ion skeletal muscle has membrane bound tubules and vesicles and is called sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium ion concentration regulates muscle contraction the calcium ion in the cytosol is 0.1 micro molar as compared to the 1500 micro molar which is the concentration in the extracellular spaces this ionic gradient is maintained by calcium ion atpase with many features of its operation similar to the sodium ion potassium ion pumps calcium ion pump expels calcium ions ions from the cytosol and this process is coupled with atp hydrolysis the pump also operates across the plasma membrane as calcium ion is associated with numerous biochemical processes in muscles at rest calcium ions are pumped into the sarcoplasmic reticulum excitation of the sarcoplasmic reticulum by a nerve impulse results in release of calcium ions which trigger muscle contraction by troponin and tropomyosin the calcium ion pump 100 kilo dalton has similar consequence to alpha subunit of sodium ion and potassium ion pump here also phosphorylation of the aspartate residue is involved so let's summarize what we have learnt in this module we of course learnt about sodium potassium pump we looked at the classification of transporters we also look at classification of atpases which themselves are transporters and we looked at the cardioglycosides as inhibitors of transport controlling ion concentrations especially sodium potassium and calcium ions inside the cell turns out to be extremely critical we'll see in the next module that concentration of some anions is also similarly regulated atpase in the mitochondrial membrane is linked to respiratory chain and catalyzes atp synthesis by oxidative phosphorylation in that context emphasizing its hydrolytic activity in its name may have looked odd we saw that the hydrolytic activity of atp is is also very important we will now continue with membrane transport in the next module as well thank you